Welcome to Sound Strategic. My name is James Crabtree, Executive Director of the IISS Asia Office in Singapore. On July the 1st, the Chinese Communist Party threw itself a giant birthday party, celebrating 100 years of its own existence in the moment in 1921, uh, when the first National Congress of the party was held. Uh, the streets of Beijing thronged with celebrants, loyal party members, to mark not just that 100th year of the party, but the rule of the party for 72 uninterrupted years in China, in a country in which the party, rather than the state, calls the shots. This is a moment when the Communist Party is ever more central uh, to China's politics, but also to its security policy at a time of growing assertiveness under President Xi Jinping and growing rivalry with the United States. So to talk about the Chinese Communist Party at 100 and what it means for China's domestic and international outlook, I'm joined today by two of the IISS's uh, most knowledgeable China watchers. First, our usual podcast host, Mayor Owens, who today swaps into the role of guest. Uh, Mayor is Senior Fellow for Chinese Defense Policy and Military Modernization here at IISS. Uh, and she has a range of expertise looking at defense analysis, regional affairs, um, as well as defense industry, innovation. And she leads IISS's research on China's digital Silk Road. We're also joined by Nigel Inkster, who is the Institute's Senior Advisor for Cybersecurity and China, and who assists on all manner of China-related research um, with a particular focus on geopolitics and technology, uh, which was the subject of a recent book that he published last year. Prior to joining the IISS, Nigel worked for more than three decades in the British Secret Intelligence Service, including in China and covering China, uh, leaving at the end of 2006. So, Mayor Nigel, welcome. Let me start with you, Mayor. The Communist Party, as I said, turned 100 in July. Why is this anniversary important and what does it signify? Thanks, James. And to say, first of all, that it's uh, great to be on the other side of the microphone, if not a little nerve wracking. For the CCP, I think this really signifies exactly as you said, that despite the challenges that it has faced over the last hundred years since its founding, when the 72 years that it's been in power, it hasn't just survived as it sees it and how it portrays itself. Uh, it has thrived and China has thrived for it. Uh, supporters of the CCP, of course, argue that China wouldn't and couldn't have become the great power that it is today without the CCP, uh, and that the CCP is leading the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation towards achieving what Xi Jinping has said uh, is the China dream. And this, of course, will signify not just um, domestic strengths and successes, such as the eradication, as Xi Jinping has uh, proclaimed, of extreme poverty, or its handling of the COVID epidemic, which it sees as uh, unrivally uh, positive and successful, or the socioeconomic economic growth that we've seen in China, or indeed uh, its technological prowess. But as you rightly say, of course, also a return of China to this global center stage in more than just political and economic, but indeed also in military terms. So in this sense, I think what all of this signifies to a certain extent is that we've seen a party that has graduated from being almost obsessed with this narrative of weakness and being humiliated at the hands of foreign powers for over a century and has almost crafted that into a new narrative of a China that is more forward-looking, more confident, and is really moving towards the future of becoming a, a great and greater power. Just before we turn to Nigel, could you explain for our listeners who may not be familiar with the Chinese system or as familiar as the two of you are, the relationship between the party and the state in China, because it's very different from what you would expect in many other countries. This is something that I wanted to touch on later in, in the conversation, because it has been a significant change that we've seen uh, under uh, President Xi's rule. I mean, during the Deng era, what we've really seen was a creation almost of a parallel system between the party with such the direction of, uh, of the country, uh, and of the country's politics and a state apparatus that implements that uh, and also has uh, some levers of control. Now, what's of course changed uh, through all of this is uh, that Xi Jinping has raised that profile and the predominance and power of that party structure. Uh, and then that uh, features now first and foremost 
uh, within uh, Chinese politics, both domestic and foreign. But of course, at the heart of Chinese politics throughout history, we've always seen that predominance of the party and the survival of the party as being the main goal of uh, of China's system uh, and ensuring that longevity of its uh, survival as well. Nigel, let me bring you in here. Perhaps you could give us your reflections on the significance of the anniversary to, to start with, but also this, this same question of the changing relationship between the party and the state to set the scene. Yes, indeed. Well, to, to follow on from what Mayer said, you know, that we need to remember that the uh, Chinese Communist Party has survived a succession of near-death experiences in, in, in the course of its lifetime. And uh, probably um, even uh, in the 1990s, not that many people would have uh, confidently predicted that it would be where, um, where it is today. The fact is that what the party seeks to do now and through this anniversary is, is to present this as an inevitable outcome um, or, or of historical determinism. You know, the, 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 the party, um, as you know, um, a vanguard elite organization has understood you know the work of the scientific, as they would put it, workings of history. They've got on top of this. You know they're riding the wave, and none of this would have been possible had the party you know not been in control. With this comes very extensive rewriting of history. Conveniently irons out all the party's most egregious mistakes um, and wrong turns. Uh, and and see, as I said, seeks to present this as a sort of seamless progress towards an inevitable outcome, and you know something that only the party could have done. This is an organisation that was forged uh, in an atmosphere of danger and conspiracy, and paranoia, and that para that institutional paranoia is still you know, very much evident. So, notwithstanding how confident. Um, an image this celebration has projected, uh, we need to remember that behind it, there, there, there are a lot of worries, a lot of concerns about what could go wrong and how to preempt it. To pick up on the point about how, how the party works, yes, I mean, you know, the fact is that the party now has moved back, you know, in, in a sense, under Deng Xiaoping, you could think of the party as the sort of board of directors whilst the you know, state or organizations and ministries were were the workforce you know they're, they're the ones who actually did it but you know they didn't have an opinion on what uh, uh, needed uh, to, to be done what you've now got is a situation in which the party not only is determining uh, the direction of travel but increasingly becoming involved in the minutiae of how that uh, is being done and you see this in all sorts of areas and so certainly under C in Ping, we've seen a much more proactive, hands-on managerial approach to addressing some of the more chronic and intractable challenges that, 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 that China faces. So it's a much more kind of hands-on thing. One thing I think when people look at China, they tend to overlook. I mean, everybody's sort of well aware of the party as a very powerful organization dedicated to the pursuit and retention of power um, with a record track record of effective delivery, if sometimes brutal. They overlook um, a thing that Mao Zedong used to talk about, which was the mass line, the way in which the party devotes enormous time and energy to sort of getting um, into the people and, and really kind of understanding what they think, what they want in ways that are you know, not typically associated with uh, authoritarian or totalitarian regimes. They do you know, expend enormous effort trying to keep a finger on the pulse of China. And that's getting more complicated as Chinese society gets infinitely more complicated. Well, let's talk about that now. So you both talked about uh, President Xi and the fact that the party has become stronger and more central under under his rule. So, Mayo, why is that? Why why is the party so central to Xi's project? Why why has he seek, sought to not just rejuvenate the Chinese nation, but to rejuvenate and strengthen the role of the Communist Party as well? Well, I think that's the case for a number of reasons. For Xi, actually. Uh, the rejuvenation of China is almost uh, become a, a personal brand of his leadership. And I think this vision for uh, a great China is something that he sees uh, it, it is time for China to capitalize on. 
and also something that, of course, only he can actually deliver upon. Uh, so for Xi Jinping to actually be able to do that, I think he's looking from his perspective, potentially, at uh, his predecessors, who, of course, had also uh, attempted to enact reform and had not gotten very far. If you look, for example, at uh, Hu Jintao and uh, Jiang Zemin's ability to control or exert control over the PLA, that necessarily didn't go very far and reforms weren't enacted. So in a certain extent, uh, leveraging this um, vehicle of the party uh, and of party centrality and party control allows Xi Jinping to build within that a system of uh, support and obedience and allegiance to himself uh, to enact uh, some of what he thinks are the most pressing changes that need to be made uh, in China. And of course, we see this through the almost ruthless uh, anti-corruption purges that occurred uh, since he came into power, uh, the purging of tigers and flies, as he named it, uh, throughout the country. The greatest contradiction here is that this ever-increasing control that uh, President uh, Xi uh, through the party seeks to amass, um, uh, in fact, actually has the ability to destabilize China and to put China on a different track and perhaps a less successful track than it has been in the past. And I'd point here to, for example, uh, the changes within uh, liberal Chinese academia, uh, so the gagging of liberal uh, professors at elite universities, the persecution of human rights lawyers, of heavy internet censorship, uh, the restrictions on academics and think tank experts about who and where and how frequently and under what circumstances they can engage with foreign counterparts to discuss and gain uh, knowledge and exchange ideas. Um, I think all of this together contributes to an environment under Xi where he doesn't only have control, but that control actually will impact the ability for feedback mechanisms and feedback loops to actually uh, enable successful or, or logical uh, policy decision making. And I think to some extent we've we've seen that take an effect. So think tankers have already mentioned uh, that this is a a detrimental uh, development within China, that they're no longer able to do so for the party and for the state. And and one actually has to wonder, of course, uh, to what extent I think this rigid and limited decision-making circle that she has surrounded himself uh, will be able to uh, exert what the party has been good and what Chinese uh, state organs, of course, has been good at doing for the past uh, decades. And that has been to move with flexibility and to course correct uh, through trial and error. I think those days, to some extent, uh, might be numbered. So Nigel Mayer's sketching out the threat here. But before we go on to that, can you tell our, our, our listeners how strong is the party today? Is it is it popular? We tend to think that uh, Xi Jinping himself is quite popular. But if you were to ask the, the man on the Beijing omnibus what they thought of the party, what what's your, your sense of, in a sense, the, the, the role the party plays in public life and, and how strong and how publicly popular it is? Well, I think at the moment that it genuinely is very popular and there have been um, you know quite, quite detailed and very scientific uh, public opinion surveys conducted not by Chinese institutions, but by Western academic institutions, Harvard University, that have been registering very high uh, levels of um, satisfaction, a general sense you know, that the party does care about the interests of ordinary people, is, you know, doing a good job of administering the country. And people have bought into the centenary celebration, I think primarily out of a, a real sense of pride in China's change in status and uh, international image as an advanced, modern, and, and very successful country. I think people genuinely relate, have related to that. And we've seen, for example, um, a lot of people engaging in so-called red tourism, going and visiting all the sites where the party had its uh, origins, reading books, watching films that probably most of the time they wouldn't want to watch because they're very propagandistic. But, you know, actually, I think, you know, taking a look at these and saying, yes, this is, you know, something you know, that we can collectively be proud of. I think that is certainly true. Um, having said that, as I mentioned earlier, the truth is that China's society has become a lot more complex than it was in the days of Mao, for example, where you could broadly divide the country into the peasants on one side and you know the industrial proletariat on the other, and that was about it. Chinese society has become infinitely more complex and more difficult to manage. 
and we're seeing, for example, in the cities, the emergence of a counterculture. Um, people who you know are increasingly saying, "Well, we don't want to work, you know, nine hours a day, six days a week, plus overtime, only to find that no matter how hard we work, we still can't get ahead." So we're going to do what's called lying flat. We're going to take it easy. We're going to aspire to a simple life, and you know, not go for all the trappings of material success and uh, and aspiration. You've got young women who um, are saying, get married, have children. You've got to be kidding. You know, why would I want to do that? The party is now trying to get people to have more children. The public response to that has been, you know, get knotted. You don't control my womb. You know, um, so, so things are getting more difficult. And the party recognizes this. They understand entirely that, that this is the case. You know, and they're, and they're working hard, you know, to, to get to get grips with it, understand the situation better, and, and uh, come up with ways of dealing with it. Having said that, I entirely agree with Mayer that this more authoritarian turn that the party has taken, you know, the party absolutely controls everything, could prove to be counterproductive. When you look, for example, at uh, the recent um, moves by the Chinese state against Chinese tech giants planning uh, IPOs in the West. There are a lot of people in China's own tech sector who are wondering whether they really do have a future outside of state control. And this is going to be an issue that could cast a long shadow of some, over some of China's ambitions. Mayor, let me ask you about those tech questions. We had uh, Jack Ma going missing for a while. We had Ant Financial being uh, um, taken down a peg or two um, in recent weeks. We've had Didi, the uh, Uber and Grab uh, rival from China, who they had an IPO in the US, almost immediately afterwards were hit by some adverse Chinese regulations. At one level, this has been interpreted as a geopolitical play of China stopping Chinese companies raising capital in the United States, just as America is stopping Chinese companies operating in the US. It's also a, a, a response to the rising power of these companies that there has been a concerted political effort done through regulators to take them down a peg or two. So why why is that happening? What, what is it that has turned these technology companies from, in a sense, the pride of China's modern economy, the embodiment of the China dream, into something that appears to have been interpreted as, if not a threat, then something that, from the party's point of view, is at least ambiguous? I'd like to be able to argue that on some level, uh, the party has acknowledged the value and significance of its private tech sector, uh, and that we're currently perhaps going through a period of adjustment in China and reining in the unbridled access to personal data and the monopolization of certain sectors by tech companies. However, there's nothing that suggests that this isn't also about maintaining political control of the party within China. And in that sense, I fear we've not yet seen the end of this. We have to keep in mind the context in which all of this is taking place. So, of course, this year is the centenary of the party. Next year is the 20th uh, Party Congress in China. And, of course, the CCP has throughout its history targeted what it feared were growing centers of power that could potentially rival its own control over the country. So in that sense, the targeting of the tech sector isn't all that new. The tech sector, after all, controls the innovative technologies that China sees the potential for future power and superiority in. And the control of data is also becoming increasingly politicized within China. None of this is thus entirely unexpected. That being said, it does seem to some extent counterproductive to pursue these aggressive policies towards the sector within China's economy that has the greatest innovation potential and that could be a lever of power and influence globally. So we're talking on this episode of Sound Strategic with Mayor Owens and Nigel Inkster about the Communist Party at 100. Nigel, Mayor mentioned civil military fusion, um, the notion that one of China's ways to advance its military is to take technology that was developed in the civil technological sectors. And this is something that is of concern to the United States and others. However, the relationship between the party, the Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army is another critical relationship and one that's of great interest to us at the Institute and in your work and in mayors. So 
Could you give us a sense of the relationship that the party, the changing relationship between the party and the PLA, and you know, dare I also ask your um, your old friends in the Chinese intelligence services as well, and the, the Ministry of State Security and uh, and others. Over the last few decades, uh, the party's relationship with uh, the PLA has um, gone through um, you know, different phases. And the first thing to say, we must remember that the PLA is not a national army. It is the armed wing of the Chinese Communist Party. Efforts by senior PLA leaders to promote nationalization, so-called, of the army have founded on this particular ideological rock. If we look at uh, the PLA and uh, modernization during the 18, uh, 1980s and 1990s, when this was going underway, PLA were basically at the back of the queue for modernization, but were given a lot of leeway to uh, pursue commercial initiatives, arms sales, etc., and a lot of generals got very, very wealthy and rather sort of, you know, sort of lost, shall we say, there's a martial inclinations and uh, needed to be kind of brought to heel and reminded what their primary purpose uh, actually was. You know, the, this culture of corruption existed in the PLA was a major challenge for Xi Jinping himself and something he put a lot of effort into trying to, to get a grip on and essentially reminding the PLA that they were under party direction and needed to remember who, who who their master was. You know, essentially the PLA, the party's always had a kind of compact with the PLA, which essentially was you stay out, you you don't interfere in politics and we'll give you quite a lot of leeway to do do your thing. That only went so far, but it did actually generate quite a lot of embarrassment uh, when when the military did things that the leadership weren't uh, fully seized of, such as the destruction of the low Earth orbit satellite that created unprecedented amounts of you know, space debris, et cetera, et cetera. So at the moment, I would say that Xi Jinping has managed to get a fairly um, good grip um, on the military by virtue of being the source of patronage uh, for promotion and by uh, eroding the relative status of land forces whilst promoting the role of the PLA Navy, the PLA Air Force, the Strategic uh, Support Force and the Strategic Rocket Force. It's never going to be easy for any Chinese Communist Party uh, Secretary General to say with confidence that you know they have uh, full control over the military. It's uh, again, one of these things that you know, it's, it's, it's a full-time job and uh, you can never take anything for granted, you always have to be on the lookout for uh, um, potential misbehavior. Similarly, with the intelligence services, relative to the army are newcomers and relatively less engaged in politics. But we've seen the intelligence services uh, fall under corrupt patronage networks in the pre Xi Jinping era under Zhou Yongkang when he was uh, the head of the party's political and, and, and legal committee, you know, having previously been a big player in China's oil and gas sector. And, and while Zhou Yongkang was in this position, it's almost as if, to use an American uh, analogy, you know, the director of central intelligence um, and the director of the FBI was also um, the head of ExxonMobil and the mob. That was kind of you know, where Zhou Yongkang sat. And he'd brought, particularly the Ministry of State Security, into his corrupt patronage network. And this is something that Xi Jinping has been trying to uh, address through a succession of of rectification campaigns, which also affect the military. It's about professionalization. It's been about professionalization. We've seen a lot of work on professionalization in the Chinese intelligence services, but it's also about political loyalty, reminding people you know, where their loyalties are, who they're actually working for, and you know, seeking to eradicate any evidence of you know, uh, foot dragging or you know, contrarian opinions taking hold within these organizations. We wouldn't want any contrarian opinions that might be dangerous. Mayor, you wanted to come in on this point. Just on that point, exactly as you just said, I mean, we only need to look back to Mao's own words in 1929 when he warned of the dangers that could result if military leaders were allowed to prioritize military accomplishments over political competencies. And we have seen today and in recent years since President Xi Jinping has been reforming this, uh, this military organization, uh, the PLA, 
that there's this focus on um, building combat readiness and actually serving the purpose of being able to fight and win a war. But on the other hand, there is a vast amount of effort being uh, built into this system uh, and exerted to uh, actually work along, you know, the three political work systems uh, that are still alive and well. And those include, for example, party committee systems throughout the PLA, uh, the political commissar system and the political organ system. And with all of this in mind, of course, it begs the question to what extent the PLA will be able to conduct its operations and its work efficiently in a flexible uh, manner with decision making being brought down to lower ranks uh, within the military and making it less of a, a purely top down environment and, and decision making body, whilst on the other hand, having to continuously judge uh, scenarios with keeping the political commissars and their preferences in mind. So in that sense, we're coming up to contradiction at the moment through which the uh, Chinese Communist Party, I think, is very well aware of the dangers uh, of uh, full military modernization and what that means perhaps for party loyalty rather than country loyalty in military operations. If I may add at this point, uh, Mayor, contradictions, as we know, is what it's all about. Dialectical materialism and the resolving of contradictions is how you deal with these challenges. That's absolutely true. But just to say that that hasn't been fully worked out yet, and that's something that we need to keep in mind, because it is important. Indeed. Maya, you mentioned a speech that Mao gave as chairman of the Communist Party. So let's um, round up our conversation by talking about the speech that Xi gave as chairman of the Communist Party on its uh, 100th anniversary. I mean, what stood out to you in this speech? People like yourself who, who have good Chinese will pass these uh, Chinese Communist Party phrases very carefully. So, you know, what was new in this? And you and Nigel have alluded to what's happening uh, in the Taiwan Straits and over Taiwan at the moment, where a, a lot of our listeners, a lot of people in the West are watching somewhat anxiously to try and divine what um, Xi and the Communist Party's intentions are towards Taiwan. So maybe you could also touch on that subject, both in the speech and, and more generally the relationship between the party and, and its ob objectives to reunify the country. Well, with regards to the speech that she made uh, on the uh, centenary uh, anniversary, I, I don't think this was the time for uh, new policy announcements and for new initiatives. Right? That is something that we'll look towards uh, in 2022 uh, at the end of the year when we see the 20th uh, Party Congress take place. But of course, what was fascinating to listen to was what Nigel alluded to earlier, that revision of history almost, that the focus and intense focus of uh, the glories of the CCP's history rather than uh, the acknowledgement of some of the problems uh, that uh, it has faced throughout its rule uh, and some of the extreme uh, implications that those have had, such as the Cultural Revolution and uh, the Great Leap Forward for average Chinese uh, citizens. That was not mentioned, that was left out of the speech. And, and I think that, again, points to that um, concern of uh, historical nihilism, as Xi Jinping calls it, uh, with regards to uh, defacing the party's glory, but also usurping, perhaps, uh, through evil hands, the, uh, the party's ability uh, and power to rule. What I thought was also quite noticeable was the tone of the language uh, in Mandarin that was used, phrases that sound uh, uh, very aggressive when translated in various different ways, uh, in English, um, but are actually quite straightforward phrases that everyday Chinese people will be able to understand very clearly as to what they mean. And we're talking here about phrases that allude to no longer bowing down to uh, foreign powers and, and the interference of others in China's affairs. Uh, and of course, uh, the greatness and the glory and power of uh, the Chinese Communist Party, the people and the nation. The other thing that I thought was really clear with regards to language was that although we've seen Xi Jinping recently give a directive that everybody has to uh, help tell China's story better, this speech really didn't make China more lovable in anybody's eyes. The leaving out of, uh, of historical uh, events, the, uh, the strong language and almost aggressive language used towards foreign powers uh, that seek to interfere in China's affairs, as he puts it, all of that together, I think, presents a China that really hasn't budged in terms of how it wants to portray itself. And the last point, uh, if I may I think she looked really stern throughout all of this. Uh, and the only time I think I saw Xi Jinping's face light up was when the J-20s flew past right before his speech started. And, and that, I think that little moment was, uh, was quite something to see. So Nigel, let me give the last word to you. May has already mentioned that we have the 20th Party Congress coming up next year. We're expecting um, a next round of big ambitious goals from the party having 
uh, ended poverty and achieved various other long, long fought for um, objectives. If we we're at the hundredth anniversary, how do you see the next five or ten years panning out for the Chinese Communist Party? Are, are things things looking up, or are things looking more challenging? Things are starting to look a bit more challenging. And if the party were honest with itself, it would acknowledge that a lot of its success has been down to luck, and some of that luck uh, looks a bit uh, as if it's about to run out. Particularly in the international arena, what were once uh, tailwinds. In terms of willingness、uh, of other countries to help China integrate into into the global system, are, are turning into headwinds now. The international scene for the Chinese Communist Party is, is much more complex and conflicted than it's been for some time. The mayor talked about the fact that、um, you know, Xi Jinping, in his speech, did nothing to make China seem more lovable. And I think that simply reflects the fact that for the Chinese Communist Party, they look at the rest of the world and see a lot of threats and a lot of challenges, which under Xi Jinping's concept of comprehensive national security need to be,、uh, you know, addressed and preempted before they、uh, acquire critical mass. Does not, to me,、uh, translate into any prospect of China. Trying to make itself more lovable、um, in 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 the foreseeable future, I expect China to continue to adopt a more assertive and more you know sort of speak challenging、uh, tone、um, in 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 international relations. I think when it comes to managing、uh, events within China, it's Harder to say which way the the, the party is going to go. They've taken this authoritarian turn not for its own sake, but because Xi Jinping believes it is necessary to get from here to there. What happens next, I think, you know, will will depend on how well he perceives、uh, China is actually doing in terms of、um, pursuing its its headline goals, all of which have been, you know, pretty much clearly articulated. It's not unimaginable that we might see a slackening、uh, of the screws in some areas, but on balance, I suspect that what we will see for the next five years is a continuation of, you know, the hardline authoritarian controlling approach that、uh, has become Xi's hallmark. In Xi's speech on the hundredth anniversary, he talked about the imperative of telling China's story better. And that is also our aim here at the IISS. So thank you very much, Mayor and Nigel, for that、uh, insightful conversation. And we'll look forward to more China-related analysis here on Sound Strategic when Mayor is back in her traditional role as host of the podcast rather than star guest. So thank you both very much. Thanks, James. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. We hope you enjoy this episode. Please do follow, rate, and subscribe to Sound Strategic wherever you happen to listen to your favorite podcast to keep up to date with all of our latest episodes. And for more in-depth analysis of international security and defense issues from around the world, why not follow the IISS on Twitter, LinkedIn, or you could even visit the IISS website. Thank you all very much. I'm James Crabtree. See you next time.